to record. Yeah. Okay. So you brought up, and again, this is why I've given you um, so much time to put together the annotated bibliography, because what you just expressed, Brooke, is one of the more difficult and challenging aspects of research. Mm -hmm. How do I know which ones are most relevant? Um, and that takes time. Yeah. So a lot of it will, will, will come down to really defining the parameters of your searching. All right, yeah. so you, you know the subject matter that you're gonna be writing your final report on. So you, the, the key words you use in your searching is, is gonna make, is gonna narrow it to some degree. But you're still gonna have a ton of information and you have to sift yeah. through that. Where, where have, how, how have you been proceeding? Like what, what, what search engines are you using? What databases are you going to? Um, I've been using Google Scholar, okay. but I also, I, I also had, there's Concordia's library that I have my friend's code oh. <laughs> goes there. Okay. So I, I have her like login. So I use, uh, so I've been, I've been searching Concordia's library as well. Okay. Um, and in one of my other classes, I, I think Lay's in the same class, we, um, we just discussed the um, Banquies, Banquies, I think, B-A-N-Q, like La Banque, I'm not sure. And it's like, a, it's a Quebec thing. Okay. Um, we just discovered it in my other class. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna look into getting stuff on there too. Okay, I'm not familiar with that, but I will certainly look into it. That's excellent. That's part of the research is finding ways to go. And of course, you have the advantage of the Concordia um, Avenue uh, yeah. but be careful with that because once you get into those databases that Concordia or any university has, there's even that much more you have yeah, to sift like, through. Yeah, there's so much. Yeah, exactly. So again, and we've discussed this, one of the, one of the ways to do it, certainly the way I approach it when I'm trying to sift through all the source material is those abstracts. So yeah. rather than the time it takes you to read the articles to read see the whether article. they're relevant, is in, before you get to that stage is to go through the abstracts and see which abstracts are most likely going to lend themselves to your specific project. Hold on, we have someone else okay. here. That man. Okay. James L. Is coming in. It's me, sir. Sorry. Should so, I change my name? Who, who is it again? Sorry. It's Maria. Maria, thank you, because I see James. Yeah, I'm just changing it right now. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> okay, so Maria. Uh, so, good morning, Maria. Um, morning. What we've been doing is discussing at this stage the annotated bibliography assignment that's due next week, I think Wednesday. Um, yeah. and have, you, have you gotten started yet? I have not, but okay. I'm going to start it like this weekend. Okay. Um, so, Brooke, you're right now the only one who's actually started getting your 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 hands dirty with this so to speak um what i was just maria what i was just talking about is and, and what brooke brought up is you know the problem is how do you know there's so much out there how do you know which ones are most relevant um and and so on that whole process of, of research um we were just discussing the importance of de making those determinations as to its relevance and importance to your project. Remember, everything is rooted towards your project. And part of the process when you're doing the research and, and, and making these decisions, it's gonna very much, depending on the five source material that you bring into, in, into, the, in, into the game, if you will, um, is gonna also shape to some degree, even though you already have an idea of the approach you wanna to take to the project, that could change based on the source material you're bringing in. You're going to be learning more about the specifics of your project. Um, and this is, that's why the annotated bibliography is so important, because it's going to start shaping the direction, the focus that you're going to take in that project, the means by which you are going to be um, arguing for this course of action or what this needs to be done to fix that particular problem or, or improve that particular situation. The abstracts are, and this is because I'm going to put up today as well, a brief um, PowerPoint on abstracts. 
all right, and we're going to discuss abstracts, the importance in the, in the case of the PowerPoint I have, it's more geared towards when you're going to have to write your abstracts. But of course, what's going to help you be able to write stronger abstracts for your final report is spending the time looking at abstracts now as you prepare your annotated bibliography. Brooke, you had a question? Uh, no, I was just processing it. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So, so, so again, to get back to your specific question, Brooke, um, yeah, the abstracts. Be careful because there is a tendency when you are going through the material to look at the page length. Oh, this yeah. one's 25 pages. I'm not touching that. Yeah. You may, you should perhaps reconsider that. I understand the dilemma. It's like, well, I'm going to have five source material, each 30 pages long. When am I going to have a chance to read all that? Yeah. And yeah, you have to take that into account and that's fair. But at the same time, you don't want to jettison um, one of your source materials uh, just because it's long. If, if you read yeah. the abstract, and if it doesn't have an abstract, then that very much involves having to read, you know, because you, you don't want to read 30 pages then, and then decide you don't want it. Mm -hmm. Read the first few paragraphs. Also, very important way to figure whether it's relevant or not before you actually have to read the whole thing. Look at their work cited, right? Most of these, if it's a scholarly peer reviewed article, mm -hmm. it's going to have a work cited at the end. And that can, that, that allows for, two things right this is now thinking strategically one is you'll be able to see what source material they used and see if it's relative and relatable to your project right to make sure that it's, it's got that but of course in that work cited there's other source material you see where i'm going You may find more source material that you can include in your annotated bibliography by looking at the work cited of one of the articles that you've already determined. Yes, this one I need. Look and okay. see what they've been using for their sources, and you may find one or two there that you can use as well. I'm not adverse to that. It's this that's perfectly legit. I do it. Yeah. Okay, so that's a little strategic um, clue uh, as, as a possible means. I, you know, I am taking into account just to reassure everyone, you know, that, you know, this is still SAGEP, you're not at the universities yet. <laughs> um, and I will take that into account when you put together your annotated bibliography. But at the same time, most of you, if not all of you, are planning on going to university. And this is really a means to help you be prepared for the kind of expectations they're gonna have at the university when you do research, all right? So, Brooke, you're already in it, so this, you know, you're, you're, you're and you, I can, I can sense your frustration to some degree. Um, <laughs> Maria and Leigh, you're going to start getting into it. I understand that you're going to feel a little overwhelmed at time with this project, especially if, if you haven't started it yet. Reach out to me, okay? Um, this is important to establish that these are relevant sources and we don't want i don't want you to cut corners with this because uh, that will be at the expense of your final project that being said if you're really struggling as we get closer to the deadline for this let's look at it together okay, okay so so let's say like hypothetically like if i were if i were to figure out my five like sources like my articles or or pdf or book or where wherever i'm gonna find it mm -hmm. let's say i could i would i be able to let's say send them to you just the five without any like without any of the annotated bibliography stuff and you could just let me know if you think that those five are are good to go great idea love it okay perfect All right well that you, you heard that maria like and like 
Lee, 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 Lake. What is it? Lee, Lay? Lay. Lay. Jesus, I'm so bad with names. Yes, um, um, yeah, so yes, yeah, send it to me. I mean, okay. certainly send it to me if you're not sure if it's um, a proper source yeah. material. That goes without saying. If you're not sure, send it to me. I'll look it over and say, no, this, this is an unreliable source. Okay. Uh, you, you can't use this. But even if you know that you've got peer reviewed and so on, by all means, send it to me. I'll look it over. I mean, chances are, if you've gotten to that point, they're going to be fine. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's what I'm here for. Okay. Okay. Um, and yes, five is a lot. Okay. <laughs> and I recognize that. Get the five. You may anticipate that it's really three that you're really going to use. But okay. you want to have the five in there. This is very common in putting together larger projects is you can have a, a very lengthy bibliography, say 10, 15 yeah. works. But you're really, really using five of them or three of them. You still want to include the others because you want to have read the others, even if you're not using them as your primary sources. They are um, still part of the discussion. And it's a demonstration as well when we get back to your establishing your ethos, your credibility that you have. And this is why I, I'm, I'm looking for five, because that lends itself to establishing your ability to research and, and, and find five sources that speaks to your credibility as, as students, right? We talked about the need to establish that in anticipation of an audience who you are going to be presenting your report to, who are going to be saying, well, who are you? Okay. And why should we trust you to do this? And at this stage in your, in, in your academic careers, if you will, um, you don't have your, you know, university degrees. You don't need, technically, you don't even have your SAGEP degrees yet. So you don't have much that you can bring in in terms of credibility. So you have to focus in on two main things. One is your ability to demonstrate that you know relevant source material and can use it properly. And then the other is writing, how well you write. Right, how well you present your argument. I mean, they remember the discussions we've had in the PowerPoints and documents and argumentation, and to be able to employ those rhetorical skills in order to not, to, you know, persuade to some degree, but most importantly, to establish the legitimacy of your argument, the logic of your argument. That's what's going to be most convincing. Okay. Okay, is that helpful? Yes. Okay, Lay Maria, that gives you a little, you can anticipate at this point. Um, if you're struggling because we, and, and the other thing I do take into account, and I know this adds more pressure and perhaps anxiety for, for you guys, is here at the college, we don't have access to, you know, the, what the universities, uh, give us access to through you know their, their databases things like jstor and, and all the other um, avenues of research i take that into account that's why the google scholar is a good way to go um this bank uh, i don't know it but i'll certainly look into it and what i may do is by sunday post some other possible links for 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 research all right, I, I have to see what, I'm so accustomed to doing it through the universities where I have access to everything. So I don't want to send things to you that you can't access. Yeah, okay, um, it's, but, um, uh, it's sorry, just to cut, not to cut you off or anything. It's the, um, for the, La Banque, it's the B-A-N-Q Grand uh, Bibliothèque. It's like a oh, big library. Yeah, yeah, think. no, okay, that's, okay, I know what it is. That, that's actually not a bad source. Um, that that's linking you to the yeah. databases at the at our at our big Quebec here in Montreal, the 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 the, the big library yeah. there. Um, of course, when you go there, the main thing is to sift through is to be able to recognize that it's a scholarly, right? Ideally, mm -hmm. peer reviewed. Yeah. 
Okay, so again, the emphasis I'll put on this, if you're not sure, look at their work cited. See who they're, who, who they're using, right? That helps you to determine whether or not they have reliability, if they're credible. And again, little trick of the trade, you got a lot of sources right there, all right? So it all links, you follow the thread, mm -hmm. all right? Um, that, that keeps it within the parameters of your project. Yeah. Okay. And if you find a source that you know is not peer reviewed, but you really think it's relevant, and I've been thinking about this more because some of your projects, you know, are dealing with you know the, the general public and so on. Um, it's possible you can incorporate that, um, but you have to be careful. And, and that's probably the type of source material you should run by me first, and, okay. and let me take a look at it. Um, but there there could be room for one or maybe even two of those, uh, depending on how you plan on using it. All right, you can use that kind of source material to show perhaps your audience in your final report, where things have gone wrong, where they've been relying on the wrong people to make these decisions, or why the data may be somewhat flawed. Because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this. But always remember, especially Leigh and, and Maria, since you haven't started yet, and Brooke, you're in it, and I'm sure you're doing this, but just as a reminder, Always know the focus of your research, and that's your project. Everything's about the project here. Everything is about what approach you're taking, what kind of argument you're making in order to fix the problem or the, your call for action, and how you best get that. Okay, so again, the other place you can be looking for some of you because your, your um, reports lend itself to it, um, is you know, government documents, All right? That's another avenue to, to explore, depending on your project, right? And that means you'd be going to government websites. Those are uh, acceptable source material because it's data-driven, right? This is the social sciences, right? And keep that in mind as well, that you, 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 you are going to want some of your source material can be, you know, really written in such a dry and uninteresting way, but it may contain the data you need. Okay. Right? And the data is huge for this kind of a project because it is rooted in the social sciences. All right. And that would be something you would say in your annotations. Well, the argument being made in this article um, doesn't really address the issue in, 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 a, in, a, in a concise way, the accumulation of data is relevant to the argument I'm making. And therefore, that is why this is one of the source materials I'm putting in my annotated bibliography. Right? You're, remember, your source material, that's, that's, those are your, that's, in a way, those are your tools. That's what you're using to not just um, help sustain your argument, but it's also the material you throw in, whether it's quoting or the data, to support your argument. In which case, it's, it's, it's kind of like a tool, all right? Because what you don't want to do is just find articles where all you're going to do is repeat what the article says. And, 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 and then, in a way, the danger of slipping into just repeating their arguments, right? You, you, you want to be sure that you are using that, not just regurgitating it, all right? That's a, it's an important distinction to make. And, that, and, the, and the best way to approach that is to be really confident in the direction of your report. And, and you're all there because we spent so much time on those proposals. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, what I want to do um, now is briefly, we won't be here long today, uh, but I want to 
just quickly go over um, abstracts, executive summaries. I think it's a good time now because you should be encountering abstracts and perhaps executive summaries in your research. And of course, you're going to have to produce those for your final report as well. So we'll pull up a PowerPoint, which I will post on Sunday. Okay, and this is being recorded and I will post this recording, but again, Sunday after I had the Sunday session. All right. Yeah. Okay, so let's My, my. Ah. Okay, so this is, it's a small PowerPoint, you know, I'm, I'm not big on the PowerPoints. But, um, for this class, I've, I've never used so many PowerPoints as I am with this class. Um, okay, so abstracts and summaries. A little bit like saying a lot with a little, and that's what, what it is, all right? And of course, in your annotated bibliography, your 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 annotations are are similar to this, right? You are going to be um, summarizing to some extent, but not just summarizing. Obviously, explaining the relevance. That's that's the distinction to make here uh, in your annotated bibliographies. But in terms of your final project, you will need the abstract, and, and we'll talk more about the structure. The abstract usually will go on the bottom of the title page, okay? Whereas in the executive summary, which is a bit longer, will go in the front matter. The front matter is that which comes before the actual body of the report. Remember, I was explaining it earlier of the, these two, as you're discovering, as you're doing your research, the importance of the abstract, your audience will see the abstract. The abstract has to really be precise and letting your audience know that, yes, this is a relevant report for their needs. And then the executive summary will expand on that to some degree. And that is, the, that is what your audience, for the most part, will be looking at throughout the project and the development of the project after they read the whole report, that's what they come back to to remind them of what is most relevant. So they don't have to go back and reread the whole report. I mean, in, in the case of yours, it's 2,000 words. It's not that long, but in, in, in the bigger scheme of things, that's the purpose of these because sometimes these reports are 30, 40, 50 pages long. They're not going to go back and reread the whole report. They're going to come back to the executive summary. Ah, yes, that's, what, that's how they were going to deal with that. Okay, so in terms of abstracts, there's different types. There's a descriptive abstract, okay? Um, this would summarize the structure of a report, but not its substance, right? This is, again, something that you want to be, at this stage, looking at while you're reading abstracts to gather your source material. It basically presents the, the table of contents in paragraph form. It's not going to tell you much. If it's a descriptive abstract, that's often going to alert you that maybe it's not enough material there to determine, to help you determine whether this is important for you. But it could, coming back to what I was saying earlier about the data. So if it's descriptive abstract, it may be saying there is, you know, we have the data regarding the, this issue. All right, without necessarily explaining why that data is important, but you'll recognize I need that data. That data will help me. All right, so look for things like that when you're dealing with a descriptive um, abstract. Um, again, you can read through this. They also describe the major topics covered in the proposal. Again, but without really giving you any um, substance. Then there's the informative abstract where you summarize the substance of your report, not just the structure. Okay, big, big difference. It's the substance. This is the type, okay, of abstract you'll be writing. And ideally, it's the type of abstract that you'll be encountering um, when you're looking for your source material. Okay, condensed discussion of the important points. 
Okay, you don't have to talk about the title or the author. All right, you just get right to it. And that's, again, because all that other information will be in the next pages. This is to let your audience know this is, this is what we're doing here. This is why it's important. Okay. So again, for your final project, you will be writing an informative abstract. I put here, it will be less than 150 words. I think you've gathered I'm not that much of a stickler for word count, but you, you have to be careful with this. The abstract is meant to be really short. So it doesn't have to be less than 150 words, but it needs to be around 150 words. You certainly don't want to go over 200 words because now then you are no longer in the world of the abstract. You are now pushing out into the world of summarization. Right? And this, we'll talk more about abstracts when we get closer, like when you're doing your outlines. Um, and we can look at some examples. And I'm hoping after you finish this annotated bibliography, so in a week or two, um, that what we'll be doing on the Friday and Sunday sessions is you'll be showing me some of your work. And again, there's like three of you here, then there'll be another three or four on Sunday where I can look at the work with you individually, but it will also be helpful for the others in the class because they'll see things that we're unpacking in a specific work, and then I'll have the time to look at their work in the same way, and you all get to benefit that way. Okay, that's what's coming reasonably soon because everything is going to zoom in I keep saying the word Zoom. It's starting to get to me. Um, we'll be zooming in to your final projects. All right. And that's where you'll really be able to develop this abstract. And remember, this informative abstract, you can write a draft of it at the beginning while you're doing and writing your, your final report. But you, in all likelihood, will be revisiting it after you have a draft of your final project. Well, you'll know more because you've put that draft together and you can come back to the abstract and then really make it better. All right. Uh, so for writing an informative abstract, you need to obviously understand the substance. Right? The key word is substance of the piece. Decide early how to organize the abstract. We'll talk more about that. Um, you, you can't do the abstract until you know what are the most salient and important points to your argument. And you may have a pretty good idea at this stage what you think they're going to be, but you can't know yet because you still have your source material you have to go through. And then you have to see after that how your thoughts evolve. That's why we're going to be doing the outline next and the importance of that outline. Okay. Uh, what are the main topics? Uh, and choose only the necessary information about the main topics. This might be the biggest challenge when you're putting together your abstracts, um, but you're getting a little practice of it by doing these annotated bibliographies. You have to be able to determine what is most relevant. You have to be, and you have to be absolutely sure about it because you only have 150 words. Now, an executive summary, this is used normally with larger technical reports. Um, it's similar to what you're doing, um, even though you guys, there's so many different avenues you're, you're pursuing. Um, it's important to get, to become familiar with executive summaries and writing executive summaries, um, especially in the social sciences when you're um, at the universities. Um, it's an extended, uh, standalone abstracts that have both informative, informative and descriptive, descriptive characteristics. It's, 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 as we discussed, everything's a process. So you go from the really condensed abstract, 150 words. That's the, the first thing that your audience is going to see. If that does, if, if they read that and they're saying, no, I'm not interested in this, they're never going to get to your executive summary. If they read the abstract, they go, yes, this is good stuff. Again, think about what you're doing now in your research. 
Then you want to get to the executive summary because now there'll be you'll it'll it'll be an expanded um, ideas of of that project or that article, right? So again, it's supposed to be, have the informative, but you also have the descriptive characteristics. So it contains both substance and structure of the report. The abstract gives that substance, and then when you expand on the executive summary, you're starting to talk about, we will be looking at it through this organization or by reviewing the data from these different sources. You don't have the room to talk about that in the abstract, but you do in the executive summaries. If in your research now for your annotated bibliographies, you come across the abstract and a kind of executive summary, and often you will, that will give you even more confidence that yes, I need this, even though it is 30 pages long. The other thing to keep in mind while you're doing the research for the annotated bibliographies, if, you, if, if the abstract grabs you, but you're not 100% sure, that's when you go and you read those first couple of paragraphs, right? And often if there isn't an executive summary, then the first few paragraphs work as an executive summary because those paragraphs are like an introduction. They should be introducing um, the most salient points and will give you further confidence as to whether or not you can use that. And of course, again, jump back and see what source material they use by looking at their work cited. And this here is, as I said, it's often used as a substitute for full report and proposal because this is where often those powers that be, those decision makers who don't have the time to go back and reread a report and so on, they'll come back to this executive summary because this will map it out in a, in a more extensive way, obviously, than the abstract. Okay. Again, we'll talk more about this when we are dealing with the outlines because in the outlines, you're going to already start putting in some of the pieces for these. Oops, where did I go? Uh, let me do that. There we go. Uh, here we are. So the executive summaries um, designed to provide key management staff with enough information about what is in a report uh, so that they can make informed decisions. Right? Again, the process, you have to start with the abstract. And the importance of the abstract is if, if the abstract isn't good, they're not going to get to the executive summary. That's how you want to be thinking about it. Obviously, you're writing this for me and I'm going to read everything. But you I keep emphasizing this, you want to be in that mindset that this is real. This isn't an assignment for school. You want things to get done here. Uh, so they can make informed decisions without reading necessarily the entire document. Okay. And, and yes, and hence the name. It's an executive summary for those executives who don't have the time necessarily, even though they should. Often the first thing that they see and then, yes, in, in the broader picture, yeah, then they will be the ones who say, you know what, let's, 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 let's go with this. Um, they're not jettison it. This is something that we may have to, add to, to deal with, and they'll send it to the next people in line who will spend more time looking at the details. I, again, I, I emphasize that because when you're writing that executive summary, that's how you want to be thinking about it. Otherwise, because if it doesn't have that quality, if it doesn't give the information that's necessary, then again, just like if it, the abstract doesn't do it, they won't get to the executive summary. If they get to the executive summary, but that's not doing its job, then they're not gonna go to the report itself. It's gonna get tossed into the garbage. Um, for, okay, so because the summaries often take the place of the report for key decision makers, right? This is what we've been talking about. Um, it goes without saying how important the writing must be. And it's also a, a great means by which to hone your writing skills. Pare it down so you have the specifics. Remember, so important to 
writing. We will be talking about writing. I don't know if I'll introduce it today. I, I really want you to focus on those anti-bibliographies. But certain, what may seem like obvious writing exercises and writing concerns, um, and I'm still gathering my information to see where we need to focus in on that, anticipate that we will be spending some time with it because it is, again, poorly written. No one's going to read it because that speaks to your credibility. You could have the best source material, the best idea in the world. But if it isn't communicated in a proper way, if it's poorly written, if there's grammatical errors, if it's too informal, they're not gonna read it. It's as simple as that. Okay. Uh, for the final problem, you will write an executive summary to include after, okay, I, we'll talk about that obviously in terms of the structure of the final report. Um, and yes, a very good thing to keep in mind when you're writing the outline, which was what, what we're gonna be doing after you finish your annotated bibliographies. You're gonna see, it's gonna, once those bibliographies are done and we start getting into the outline, that's where I would argue everything is gonna to start to come together. Um, so typically an informative abstract answers these questions about 100 to 2, see it, the word length is, is, again, I'm not overly concerned, but these, this is an important one. You want to keep this in mind at all times while you're doing this project. Why did you do this study or project? What did you do and how? The big how. What did you find? What do your findings mean? The reason you have to know what your findings mean is that will direct you towards the type of action that you're looking for. All right, and what do your findings mean? The findings are your research. Right? You're all coming with an idea and then there's, a, you know, there's an issue that you want to address. But now you have to do the research and see what the research tells you about what, what does it mean, you know, is, is, which also will shape the way that you can approach that issue or, or problem. The importance of the research, which is what you're in the midst of doing now. Um, okay, so these are just tips. Uh, so you know, I repeat or rephrase the title. Okay, little things. We don't have to go through this in detail now because this is more for when you're writing yours. Um, but I will post this. It's something for you to look at, but this doesn't really pertain so much to what you're doing specifically in terms of your annotated bibliographies at this point. Okay. All right, so again, I'm, I'm giving you this now, so in, in, at this stage, look at this as something that can help you with the research and the preparing of the annotated bibliography more than anything else. But as you've seen with all the other documents that we've been going over and, and, and these sessions, there's a lot, right, logical fallacies, which again, keep that in mind while you're doing and preparing your annotated bibliographies, but all that is, seemingly all, you know, taking up a large space in your minds at this point, perhaps. We're gonna bring that all together when we get to the outlines, all right? And that's, you know, everything is gonna be heading that direction once we finish these annotated bibliographies, okay? Perfect. Questions? I don't have any. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, Brooke, I think that's a great idea. The, the, the rest of you, keep it in mind. Send me, you know, without the annotation or even with your annotations, if you want, consider it to be a draft, yeah. right? I'll give you some general comments about it. I'm not going to do too much. And keep in mind, um, I, know I, I know I sound like the bro proverbial broken record here, but do keep in mind that all this, when you're saying, oh, well, to do this, blah, blah, it's all geared towards the final project. The emphasis for this course is that final project. Yeah. Everything else you're doing here, the assignments and the grades and all this stuff, it all is going to be reflected in that final project. And that's where I'm putting my emphasis in terms of uh, my role as instructor here. Okay. And I want you to always be thinking about that. And that's what makes this course a bit different. That's why we have the flexibility that we have in this course. And that gives you that 
added freedom. But again, as I remind you every week, with, oh, what's the cross? Uh, with, with great, I'm going to do my Spider-Man there. With great power comes great responsibility, right? We all know that. Well, with great freedom and flexibility in academia comes great responsibility. And that responsibility is on you. I'm here. And I would argue I'm probably more approachable than what you're going to have when you get to university <laughs> and the professor's yeah. there. Okay. So take advantage of that. Okay. This is all preparing you. There's a purpose. Always remember, ask yourself, why am I doing this? What's the purpose? The purpose is to prepare you for a large extent to be able to do these types of reports at university or out in the real world. It's not just to get a grade and do the course. This course is not like that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, Maria, Lay, any questions? I just want to be sure for the annotated bibliography. It's you have like a word document that I could just go through to look at it just to be sure I'm on the right track because you have one on the documents. Right. So your question is? I was just saying I can look at that one just to be sure I'm on the right track. Oh, absolutely. Sure. That okay. that's what those documents are there for. Yeah, I mean, I've posted a lot of material for this class. Go back to it. Yes, it's right now you guys should all have that document on the annotated bibliography like up every time you're working on it. Okay, perfect. Everything you need is there, right? And there's an example of how to write it and everything else. That doesn't help you finding your source material, but certainly tells you how to approach it and what it should look like at the end. Okay, perfect. And I also have another question. It's not for this class, so it's for English. Okay. I got a message on my phone saying it's a, I got a document talking about the exit exam for English. Right. And I was saying it's on December 16, like the day you told me, and it's at 8.30, but... As I was reading it, it's, it seems to me that we have to go to school and do it. Is that true? Like, do you know any of the details by any chance? Or? No, and, and I, I'm not even sure that they know, right? It's, it, this is the ongoing situation, obviously, related to COVID-19 right. as to whether they're going to have it in the classroom. And the problem is if they don't have it in the classroom, I don't know if they can have it at all, right? They canceled it okay. last semester, and they're yes. really – they can't afford to cancel it again. Yeah. As soon as I have precise information, I will be posting it. Okay. okay. And that, Brooke, have you taken the exit exam? No, actually, I haven't. Okay. But like, I because I'm I'm finishing the semester, so I yes, yeah. like I just don't know what like what what I need. Like I because I we applied to university, so basically it's just we got accepted on like conditional acceptance um based on us completing our deck but i guess we can't really complete our deck without the, the exit exam right you're gonna so, I, so if they they cancel it i don't know i i guess i don't know yeah well th this is this is again one of the issues is and i'm not sure how they navigated through it when they canceled it last semester they made exceptions i don't think they're going to do that again so in, in, yeah. in some way you're going to have to take that exit exam and it yeah. will be on the 16th of, of December, whether it's going to be in the classroom at TAV. Um, I'm sure that's what they're hoping to do. Yeah. As long as they can, you know, remain within the, the, the guidelines. Um, and, but the, where the problems come is there are going to be students or parents of students who may have a problem with the idea mm -hmm. of going into the classroom, depending on what the numbers look like in December. Mm -hmm. So that's why they may be hesitant to getting out, making final determinations of that. But I will pursue that. I, I've already tried a bit, but I'm getting, well, we don't know yet. Okay, so yeah. as soon as I know, I'll get that information. And if you, any of you get that information, if you hear from another source, please let me know so I can let all my other students know as well, because many of them yeah. are in the same boat. I, I, I haven't heard anything. My friend is at Dawson and she has to do it as well. She just, so she told me that hers is on the 16th as well, because we're all doing the same one, I guess. Yeah. So she's, um, so I know hers is on the 16th, but like, would, is there any chance, let's say like, oh, like we wouldn't be like signed up for it or like, let's say it comes on the 16th and like, there's not enough room or there's no, that's not. No, Brooklyn, I read the message and it said that like, we're all eligible for it. If we did a certain English class, like the one that I think before, the one we did last semester, the or I can't remember which one it was, but if we did that type of English class, then we're eligible for this exit exam. 
Okay. If yeah. we completed all our Englishes, I think. So we have already, and this is our last English before our last yeah. semester, be, last semester before uni, uh, uni, so I think we're good. Yeah, also keep in mind, um, I think you have to register for it. Like, yeah, like, do we, ha do we have to do that? Because, like, do we have to, like, go on a website or something? Or? I, I, again, I, 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 I don't want to misspeak. I, I don't know. I will, you know, if I can't, mm -hmm. let, me, let me continue to try and get the answers to this. Um, but, Brooke, you, you might want to pursue this with your friend at Dawson. Yeah. Because um, they, they may have posted something on Dawson on their website. It's a little more um, elaborate. Um, and there may be information coming from there. And if you do, please let me know. I will pursue it from my end. And yeah. I will actually try to ensure that we, we, everyone knows what's going on with this um, by next week. Because Perfect. Perfect. December 16th, it's going to be here sooner than, than we yeah, realize. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. I got the message here. And it says your students currently registered for 603-103 MQ and have successfully completed 603-101 MQ and 102 will be automatically registered for the exam. Ah. So I think if we've taken already those Englishes, which I think we have, I think I know I took one with you last semester, now this semester. And right. I think I took those two, two semesters ago. So yeah, I think I've completed them. And I says it's already, reg already registered for the exam. Okay, so it, and, and so it's 101, 102, and 103, right? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, 103, 101, yeah, 102. Yeah, exactly. yeah so if, if that's accurate, um, and this, you know, for, for Lay and, and Brooke, then that would su suggest that if you've taken those three classes, you don't have to register. You're already going to be automatically registered. Yeah. And right. that would make more sense to me because when I heard that they have, you guys have to register, I'm going, why hasn't, why haven't you all been informed of this? Yeah. yeah. And been told how to go about doing that registration. So it yeah. sounds like it, from what you were just reading, Maria, that you are automatically registered if you've taken those three core English courses. And yeah, because I think, because what I think it is when it's not COVID, you're eligible to take the exam when you take your third English. And let's say if you fail, you can take it again when you do the fourth. But I guess because for us, when we did our third English, it was canceled because of COVID, that they're, they're not even giving the option to the people in the third English. They're just saying, okay, here, you're in your fourth. Like, you need to do it. You have no chance. Like, not you have no chance, but you have no other options. Like, you need to take it. Well, yeah, especially if you guys are in your last semester yeah. here, it, it has to be done. Yeah. So I will, I will continue to pursue it, but that, that, se that makes sense. That, that, that sounds logical to me. Yeah. Um, and you've all taken 101, 102, and 103, right? Yes. Exactly, yeah. 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 Leigh, you have as well? Yeah, I did. Okay, so again, if you get confirmation of that before I do, please let me know. Okay. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. and send me like a, a link, tell me where you got that confirmation so that I can make sure that I can get to the other students as well. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you, Maria. That was very helpful. No problem. Um, anything else? Uh, I'm good okay. for now. <laughs> okay. Listen, the last thing I'll leave you with, and as a reminder, what I'm anticipating after these annotated bibliographies, so in the next couple of weeks, is that these sessions on Friday and Sunday will then be, show me what you've got on your outline. Okay. Let's go over it together. Yeah. And if there's only three, four people here, we'll be able to do all three or four. And if I'm doing, and keep in mind, if I'm say, Brooke, I'm looking at yours, Maria mm -hmm. and Lay, be attentive because it'll be different, but there'll be things that I'll be saying that are important and relative specifically to Brooke's, but that will also relate to yours even if I don't directly go the same way when I'm looking at yours as well, if that makes sense. In other words, I think you can really get a lot, even if the project seems radically different, certain general ideas that I'll be relating to or talking about will apply to everyone. So that's where it's, I think it's gonna get, where I'm not gonna come in with PowerPoints and everything else like we've been doing. It's like, okay guys, show me what you got. Let's do this together. Let's put one of yours up there and let's go look at it. All right. And I think that's going to be very helpful. And, and we'll be doing that for the last few weeks as we get towards that final report. And we'll talk about developing drafts after the outline, the drafts of the report and so on. We're all going to work together on that. Um, Got to take advantage of the fact that we're such a small class. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's, it's rare. I think 
And then this one yeah. for next semester, I think it's got like well over 20. So I'm not <laughs> going to be able to do it in the same way. So you guys are, are, are reaping the benefits of having the small class for this course. Okay, perfect. All right, everyone. Yeah, you're on the Okay, good. so let me stop the recording.